Hey guys, it's David, and in this video I wanted to demonstrate how extra biblical books can help us interpret the Bible. And to prove that, I will give two examples. Whenever we talk about extra biblical books, there's a lot of fear and uncertainty expressed by Christians, and I can understand why. The Bible is God's inspired word after all, while these other books aren't. Why would we look into these apocryphal books when all we need is in the Bible? And that's true on one hand, but it's also true that the biblical writers read works of their time and were influenced by them. Paul, for example, quotes pagan poets and philosophers, while Peter and Jude make obvious allusions to the book of Enoch and Jude even directly quotes from it. Um, my goal in making this video is not to argue that these extra biblical books should be in the Bible. As a matter of fact, I don't believe that at all. I believe the canon is complete with its 66 books and that God has providentially arranged it that way. Nor am I saying that these apocryphal books like Enoch, Jubilees, Jasher, were actually written by these biblical figures. It's much more likely they were written by anonymous authors claiming to be these important biblical figures. They are what's called pseudepigrapha. Nevertheless, these books can still provide us with valuable information as to how the ancient Jew interpreted the Bible. I'm simply arguing that the New Testament writers read these books and in order to understand them better we should read what they read. Make sense? In this video I will primarily focus on the book of Enoch or first Enoch as scholars call it because as we shall see it has heavily influenced the New Testament writers. With the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls we now know that the book of Enoch dates back to at least the second century BC. It's part of what's called apocalyptic literature and we have two books in the Bible who fit into the same literary class, namely Daniel and Revelation. Apocalyptic literature is highly symbolic and therefore it's useful to study contemporary works to help us understand the symbolic language better. Here's an example from the book of Revelation. Chapter 8, verse 8 to 9. The second angel blew his trumpet, and something like a great mountain, burning with fire, was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. I've always wondered what this great fiery mountain might be. Is it a volcano? Is it a meteor or something? Well, it turns out None of those things are true. The same language is used in the book of Enoch to describe divine beings or angels. Here, I'll prove it to you. Let's look at two passages of the book of Enoch to confirm this statement. And this is the protagonist, Enoch, speaking about his visions of the underworld, okay? So, chapter 18, verse 12. Beyond this chasm I saw a place where there was neither firmament of heaven above, nor firmly founded earth beneath it. Neither was there water on it, nor bird, but the place was desolate and fearful. There I saw seven stars, like great burning mountains. And the second passage, chapter 21, verse 1. I traveled to where it was chaotic, and there I saw a terrible thing. I saw neither heaven above, nor firmly founded earth, but a chaotic and terrible place. And there I saw seven of the stars of heaven bound and thrown in it together like great mountains and burning in fire. As we know, stars is a common metaphor for angels. For example, Revelation chapter 9 verse 1. And the fifth angel blew his trumpet and I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottom bottomless pit. So what is the great fiery mountain? It is an angel. And that's how extra biblical books can help us with Bible interpretation. Okay? Let's look at another example 
from the book of 1 Peter chapter 3. Okay? Verse 18 to 22. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. What is going on in this passage? Peter seems to be combining ideas from all over the place. But once we understand what Peter is alluding to here, it makes all the more sense. Peter viewed Enoch as a type of Christ. And a type is a sort of unspoken prophecy, a foreshadowing of a kind. Paul uses typology when he compares Adam to Christ in Romans chapter 5. He even calls Adam a type of Christ. Similarly, the sacrificial system and the feast days pointed to an ultimate fulfillment that was found in Jesus Christ. They were foreshadowing things to come. That is what a type is. So in the same sense, Peter viewed Enoch as a type of Christ. Why? Well, because he's clearly referencing the events that took place in the book of Enoch in this passage. And if you don't know the story of Enoch, it basically goes like this. Um, the book of Enoch describes the sin of the watchers who were 200 rebellious angels who descended to earth upon Mount Hermon during the time of Jared and took wives for themselves in order to produce their own offspring. And that resulted in the Nephilim being born, who were mighty men and men of renown, as the Bible describes it in Genesis 6. And God is wroth with these angels and then binds them in the bottomless pit for a long time. Then Enoch the righteous is petitioned by the watchers to plead with God for their forgiveness. So Enoch goes to the underworld, goes to the watchers, and listens to their plea and takes it before God, who outrightly refuses it. Then Enoch goes back to the underworld and tells the watchers what their fate is, namely that they're doomed. That's the basic story. So with that in mind, Peter seems to be alluding to these events. To him, Enoch was the type and Jesus Christ the anti-type. And now it is time for Jesus himself to go into the underworld and preach to the spirits in prison, the watchers, and tell them their fate. And what did he proclaim to them? Well, <laughs> that they're still doomed. And this is me speculating, but I can imagine it going down like this. Um, the watchers see Jesus descending into the underworld and they think, what the what's going on? Did we win? The Son of God is here. Did we win? And Jesus tells them, Oh, don't mind me, I'm just here temporarily. Oh, and by the way, you're still doomed. I'm going to rise from the dead and parade you all in front of the heavenly host as a show of my victory. That makes sense, doesn't it? And the last bit about parading his enemies I took from the teachings of Paul from Ephesians chapter 4 verse 8. So those are just two examples where the book of Enoch has given us valuable background information which helps us interpret the Bible better. That's all I wanted to demonstrate. Perhaps it's useful to read what the New Testament writers read in order to understand the writings better. Don't you think? Uh, that being said, there's also a certain amount of care involved when reading these books because some of them came after Christ and were influenced by Gnostic teachings, such as the infancy gospels of James and Thomas. So if you decide to dig a bit deeper into extra biblical books, keep that in mind. They are not authentic, they are pseudepigrapha, and some of them were influenced by Gnostic teachings.
And that's why the church rejected them. So that's all. Thank you guys for watching. God bless you. Bye-bye.